This is the second book that you've written about your brother. That's right, yes. Um, my mother and I came out with a book in the year 2000. And um, I just felt over the years I've so much more has come to light. And um, I just wanted to get so much more out there and give people a more of a, a feeling of really who Michael was. There's also, uh, aside from your book, Michael, My Brother, Lost Boy of NXS, uh, there are a couple of other big media events that are coming out later in the winter uh, that, that really, I think, will spark a resurgence of interest in the band and in Michael's career. Uh, that uh, high-definition re-release of Live Baby Live, the uh, mm -hmm. Wembley concert, is coming out very soon. Yes, and... It, it's interesting because my book starts off, the, the first chapter, as you know, was all about behind the scenes at Wembley. Yes, that uh, it's a fascinating uh, story that you're telling there, and it'll be a great backstory for anyone who goes and sees the movie later in the uh, winter. Uh, so even in the title, we talk about The Lost Boy of an Excess. You mention um, sometimes about the book Wendy and Peter. Uh, there, mm -hmm. There's certainly something of a Peter Pan story here, especially in light of the fact that, you know, you, you raised your younger brother, at least uh, you watched him for a significant time uh, as he was growing up. Mm -hmm. The Peter Pan references here. Tell me about mm. that connection for you and, and how that all draws together. Well, you, as you say, it, it, it does have a very similar story there to what our story was and um, I just felt since Michael was such a poet and that's how he thought of his lyrics poetry yeah. mm -hmm. um, we decided to take the theme through the book and uh, it seemed appropriate to have uh, Peter Pan and Wendy there mm. um, so we bring up uh, many books many poetry books and, and all the, the uh, kind of books that Michael grew up with. And, uh, yeah, and it, it, it was a very favorite of, a favorite of his as a child. Tina, you, you found your way to the United States uh, as you reached adulthood before Michael, so you set the stage for, for him in terms of the career. Uh, I came directly from Hong Kong. To California yeah, okay and just very shortly after that the family went back to Australia yes uh, maybe two years after that my mother arrived with Michael do you recall uh, their arrival in the in California as a as a happy time for you and your mother and brother well I was certainly happy to see them and they were relieved to see me I think that uh, back in Australia there was uh, some problem, but mm. uh, yes, I was, and I actually moved in with them. I had my three-year-old son, and it was very interesting because there was Michael sort of uh, pay, playing my role that I played with him. Oh. He was helping me with my son as I worked. He would uh, go, to, he was going to Hollywood High, North Hollywood High, and he'd uh, swing by Brent's little um, kindergarten, pick him up and bring him home and keep him there until I arrived. So it was an interesting time. So he got a chance to, uh, to uh, watch a little one for a while. And then, of course, later uh, he had his own daughter. Um, and yes. and uh, I guess uh, my question would be uh, having a chance to uh, watch over your son uh, did that make him a better father? Oh, you know, Michael was a terrific father. He was always good with children. Mm -hmm. He loved children. It was just something within him, you know, and um, I loved watching him with Tiger Lily. He was, he just, he was so much in love with that little baby. Tina, if I may uh, switch gears and, and talk about uh, uh, really the... Uh whirlwind, globe-trotting days of Michael and NXS. We were in, in a period where, to be fair, it was really the, the height of, uh, for lack of a better term, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. 
Yes. And uh, yes. he was he was at the pinnacle of achievement, and he was well, frankly, enjoying all the benefits of of the business. Wouldn't you say? Uh, yes, I think everybody was at that time. <laughs> right. There were no holds barred, and it was uh, it was quite a time. Mm-hmm. I'm reluctant to go to the the incident that caused Michael's brain injury, but um, it's something that I'm sure that you've thought about and probably replayed time and time again. Can you tell us uh, your impression these days after a couple of decades of hindsight, what exactly happened? Well, uh, Michael and Helena were on their way home from picking up some take out. They were on their bikes, their push bikes, and um, I guess a cab came around the corner and they were in the way and the cab driver was quite impatient. Um, I mean, Helena says this insane cab driver jumped out and punched him. Uh, he, Michael went straight back and fractured his head. Uh, he passed out, and he had actually did have blood coming out of his mouth. It was quite serious, and he was taken to the hospital. Um, and uh, but they wanted to keep him for observation, and he did not want to stay there. He was uh, very angry, and uh, he had... Uh, the thing is, he didn't tell the family about all of this. Mm. He, he said that he'd had an accident, that he didn't talk about it, and she kept it secret for all these years. Tina, now, let, uh, if I may, if I may dive into that just a little deeper, mm-hmm. was it was it because of the context of where he was, international superstar, that you know he just didn't want to bother people with what he might have considered to be a petty little incident? Was it a question what, of maybe invincibility that somebody might uh, develop? Uh, in, in that yes. kind of surrounding, or did it go back to to all of the influences of, of his childhood, or all of that? I think what was going on at that point, according to Helena, when he said he didn't want her to tell anybody, including her parents, I think that he was so afraid after speaking to the uh, specialists on this um, who obviously told him about some of the things he m- may uh, may uh, find comes along in his life after this uh, incident. Um, I think he was afraid hearing the word, um, you know, fractured or brain damage. I think he, in his mind, he possibly felt that maybe the band wouldn't think he could write anymore. Or perform he was very upset about the whole thing and he simply didn't want people to know and the thing is what I noticed when delving more into this is that people with a traumatic brain injury uh, can be very much bothered by loud music uh, crowds strange lighting, and that was Michael's life. Yeah. And I did, when I went back and went through photographs with him and and concerts, I noticed that he wasn't just wearing his dark glasses, you know, out out in the sun, sunlight. He was wearing them when he was singing on stage, which told me that uh, the lighting must have been bothering him. Um, and he, his whole personality changed. Hmm. It, it was it was a terrible time. But you know, when somebody moves around so much and they're living on the other side of the world, and they just come in for you know, he would come over to LA for a week at a time. You don't get a full fix on how they're going. You know, he used to say. I would say, uh, what's what's really going on with you? And he'd say, ah, don't worry about it. Let's, let's go have a good meal. Let's have some fun. He mm-hmm. just didn't want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. 
you're convinced and and I would think most of most medical wisdom then is is such that uh, th- that brain injury led to uh, ultimately his death. Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, you, I think you you didn't mention the movie Mystified. Yes. I think you probably meant to. Yes, yeah. indeed. Um, so Richard Lowenstein, um, the director writer of that, we were in contact. We've always been in contact. And while I was writing my book, and he was putting the movie together, and he took uh, Michael's. Um, coroner's report to uh, someone who specializes in brain injury and um, she said absolutely after reading the whole 30 page report Mm. that the type of brain injury he had was very susceptible to somebody who would take their own life it was a tremendous loss uh, and and you don't need to hear that from some guy in Delaware saying that. I I am, am so sorry for your family's loss. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I I know everybody feels that loss. He, he made such a mark on everybody, I think. We are uh, about to celebrate Halloween, and, and part of our ongoing Halloween soundtrack is, is spinning Devil Inside by NXS. Uh, remarkable songwriting beautiful it's it's just a beautiful hit song is is what it is and um we'll, we'll certainly be playing that again here in the next couple of days and going back and listening listening to uh in excess from those wonderful days in the 80s and into the 90s where they were making such great music uh is is truly a special adventure and you mentioned adventure more than once in in your book um Michael lived quite an adventure, did he not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the one thing that I hold on to is um, he he died at 37, but he had an, a magnificent life. He really tried it all. So um, I'm very happy for that. And thank you, Tina, so much for uh, coming on and talking with us. We're looking forward to seeing you Sunday noontime at uh, Barnes & Noble at Christiana Mall, and then again uh, Tuesday night, Fairless Hills, Pennsylvania, at the Barnes & Noble. That's a 7 o'clock signing. Uh, So Tina Hutchins coming to the Delaware Valley. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. I understand that this is the second book that you've written about your brother. That's right, yes. Um, My mother and I...